Jesus is my rock and that's how I roll. Welcome to another episode of California Preaching. So today, guys, you're going to hear one of my personal testimonies. I love personal testimonies because I feel like it just brings everybody together and it helps you realize that you are not alone in this world and that so many of the feelings that we think are unique to ourselves are actually feelings that all of us pretty much feel universally. So in this particular testimony, I do talk about the armor that I created around myself as a child because I felt so unsafe in the world. So uh, it's, a, it's an aspect of my testimony that I've never shared before, and I'm excited to let you guys in on another little window into my life and journey. California Healing is a group of women, 75 going strong, and we do uh, small groups, 25 women in each group, and we are starting a new one. It's launching on September 9th, and I pray that you will fill out the application form so that you can pop in free to one of my sessions so that you can check it out for yourself to see if maybe this would be something that would be beneficial for you and in your walk with God. If you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, it doesn't matter. It's basically just a support group and a lovely place to land your plane. So here we go. I hope you enjoy my testimony and peace of Christ. I do have a testimony for you guys today and I did write it down. So I'm going to, I'm going to read it. Father, just let my words, you know, come out naturally and, and thank you for the power of testimony because it does bring uh, people closer and helps us remember that we're all so different, but also so much alike. Amen. In Jesus name. The most beautiful flower of all is honesty, but it comes at a price. I have defects black holes and I have hypersensitive areas. It's terrifying to let people see these sides of me because I'm afraid that they're gonna take advantage of my weaknesses or worst of all, have self-pity for me, have pity over me. I remember being about 14 years old when another kid walked up to me holding a copy of People Magazine. He was clenching it in his hands and he looked at me dead in the eyes and it had an image of my father and my sister Mackenzie on the cover. And he blurted out, hey, your dad's in jail for selling drugs on the black market. Surprisingly, this was the first I was hearing of it as my parents were already divorced and my father lived on the East Coast. We were on the West Coast and I was completely estranged from my dad. My throat tightened up and I just remember feeling instantly this terrible feeling of embarrassment. But the most pervasive feeling was that I felt threatened. Suddenly my wall of protection that I had fiercely guarded felt like it had, it had hairline fractures on, in it and that people could penetrate uh, what I thought was this unbreakable armor that I had so desperately created as a child. <laughs> it was a dreaded feeling. I had banked everything on this shield to defend me against this exact feeling that I was having in this moment. But suddenly I had been ambushed and that armor had failed me. Suddenly it was as if I were standing in front of an x-ray machine and everyone could see right through me. I felt utterly exposed. My heart had nowhere to hide and suddenly my eyes began to well up. And the worst thing that could have ever happened, ever happened was that I began to cry. It makes me so sad, I'm gonna pause for a second, because it makes me so sad to think that at 14 years old, I already had all of this going on to protect myself from the world, you know? And that I was afraid to be vulnerable. I was afraid to cry. I was afraid to let people see that I had emotions and that I had feelings. It just breaks my heart. But my friends who were around me at, the, at this very moment and who loved me very much leaned in to give me a hug saying things like, oh, Chai, I love you, it's okay. And my immediate reaction was to say, I don't need your effing sympathy. Yes, I remember using that exact verbiage, by the way. <laughs> Even at that age, I remember thinking that that was such an unkind reaction that I had toward my friends. I remember thinking that that wasn't a normal reaction. I distinctly remember thinking my friends are just doing what good friends do. They're being nice. They're being supportive and loving. So why do I hate them so much in this moment? Why do I feel so angry? If striking them could have been an option and an appropriate response in that moment, I would have. I would have hit them. 
It was an uncontrollable rage that was racing through my body and through my veins, and I didn't understand it. But at the same time, it was something that I was all too familiar with. I must have learned at a very young age that I needed to guard myself against vulnerability, against being perceived as being needy. Being needy was the most disgusted emotion. I couldn't allow myself to have needs. The most important thing I needed to guard myself against was having needs. I couldn't have any needs whatsoever. That seemed like the logical solution to my really sad dilemma. The reason I couldn't have these needs was because I knew they wouldn't get met. Therefore, I made sure I had zero. I had none. That way, I couldn't be let down, couldn't be disappointed. I wouldn't have to face the reality that I really did miss my dad, that I really did want to be close to my dad, that I really did want and crave and desire and desperately need a relationship with my father. Whether it was because they were alcoholics or drug addicts or just plain not interested in, in investing in emotional connected relationship with me as a child, I didn't know. All I knew was that China had to play the invisible girl game or I would make myself a moving target. My secret was that I had people in my life that I desperately wanted to love and that I desperately wanted to be loved back by. But that feeling of love and that reality of what I was, of what I was receiving was not in alignment. And it hadn't been in alignment up to that point. So the primal feeling of need was uh, not allowed. And I had to pretend that they didn't exist. I saw the same shrink for 18 years. I started very young in therapy, eight years old, and her name was Marlene Schoen, and I'm sure I put all three of her children through college. <laughs> her, main session, her main mission as my therapist was to try and teach me that perfection was actually imperfection. My Marlene time obviously paid off to some degree because I love unmade beds. I actually love when people are drunk and crying and cannot be anything but honest in that moment. I find it so endearing when people's guards are down. I love the look in people's eyes when they realize they're in love. I love the way people look when they first wake up and they've forgotten their surroundings and their hair is all over the place. I love the gasp that people make when their favorite character dies in their favorite streaming show. <laughs> I love when I catch people daydreaming just gazing off into nowhere. I call those micro seizures and I have them all the time. I'm like, people are like, Chaya, where did you go? I fall in love with people and their honest moments all the time. That's why I let people in when they let me see that they are imperfect. It makes me feel safe. I love, I fall in love with people's breakdowns and their smeared, make, smeared makeup and their smelly armpits. <laughs> Honestly, to me, it's just so beautiful. I just can't even put it into words when people are imperfect. I'm scared of everything. And I know it's not biblical to be that way as a Christian. I got invited on a river rafting trip yesterday by my sister-in-law. And I told her I was afraid of falling out of the raft, hitting my head on a rock and floating downstream in freezing cold water, coming to the thousand foot waterfall and going feet down first the waterfall, plummeting, plummeting to my death. I followed that up with any other ideas. <laughs> You know, I get frustrated with myself that this is the way my brain works. But with the help of everybody in Cow Heel, I'm starting to take my negative thoughts captive. And I'm experiencing the sound mind and peaceful, peaceful heart thing on a much more regular basis. One of the worst feelings is the feeling that time is running out, that time is relentless. And I have so many things that I wanna do with my life yet. Where is that really coming from? Is it my ego? Is it my fear of dying and not leaving a mark that everyone else can see? How terribly embarrassing to admit it is true. I want to be remembered, but why? I'm sure my childhood rejection and my deeply rooted abandonment issues take a major play in this role. It doesn't help with that neurosis of wanting to be remembered. I'm sure that all of us just wonder why we are even here in the first place. What's the reason for all of this life stuff? And why do I feel like I want to be remembered? Part of it is because I don't feel that I was acknowledged by the most important people in my life. And so I want to be remembered. And that's really painful to admit that the reason I struggle with wanting to be remembered is because I was not seen by the most important people in my life. We were created by a living God and Jesus Christ 
is his son. Could it really be that we were born to recognize this truth and to revolve our lives and purpose around this one truth? My absolute favorite verse in the Bible is Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ reign in your heart as we are called in one body to live in perfect peace and always be thankful. I'm embarrassed to admit that I have not been one to live in gratitude. It's a muscle that I've had to develop over time. Living in gratitude takes discipline because it's so easy to find things wrong with my life. It's so easy to complain about so many different situations in my life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Maybe that's our calling. Maybe that's our purpose to rejoice always and to pray without ceasing and to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Can we be remembered for rejoicing always? Can we be remembered for praying without ceasing? Can we be remembered for giving thanks in all circumstances? For this is the will of God. It gives me the chills. He told us why we're here. He told us what we should be remembered for. And then there's Psalm 107.1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. There are a zillion pieces of scriptures like this in the Bible. It's so attractive when we see people with a genuine smile on their face. And when we see people laughing freely, like a Proverbs 31 woman, Proverbs 31.25, she's clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. She laughs without fear of the river rafting trip and hit, hitting her head and going down the river with blood and falling down the waterfall and falling to her death. This is not what God intended for me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this group is called Identity. I personally chose this name for the group because it is my greatest desire to know my true identity. My identity is not on my driver's license. My identity is not even on my birth certificate or on my passport. My identity lies in Christ, period. End of story. In this Cal Heal experience, I pray that we will all find our identity in Christ while exercising a welcoming spirit to be open-hearted and generous, to stretch, to stretch outwards beyond our fleshy selves into the fullness and richness of the entire body of Christ. To find our identity in Christ is, is also in connection with finding our identity in his loving people. One of the most effective ways to locate our hearts in a gospel identity is to pray for our afflicted sisters, praying with each other, but mostly praying behind each other's backs constantly praying for each other. I'm thankful for this opportunity to get to know you all better and to allow the hairline fractures of my trauma to give you a window into my complicated and messy existence. I was praying with my husband the other day and at the end, he, at the end of the prayer, his long prayer, my husband's very long-winded, um, he said, and in, and in closing, I'd like to say, and I was like, <laughs> You just said, and in closing to God, Lord, this is my prayer. The greatest person who has ever lived now dwells richly within all of us here. And the greatest thing that has ever been done now shapes and reorders our lives, which is you, Jesus. May we overcome as you have overcome. Teach us to live by the shadow of the cross in the light of the empty tomb under the weight of heaven and in anticipation of your great return. Amen. <laughs>